Hello there, and welcome back to another Monster Monday, a series where I draw a creature from D&D, and I talk about its lore and its history, and what it's like to fight in-game as well. These videos, as always, are based on your suggestions, which you leave me down in the comment section below, and today's is no different. Today's suggestion was made by Nathan Kavanaugh, K-A-V-A-N-A-G-H. I hope that's how you pronounce your name, Nathan. And I know today's suggestion was hugely popular. A lot of you have been very, very excited about this classic D&D icon. But Nathan was the first to leave this suggestion for me down in the YouTube comments. And once I receive a suggestion like this, I add it to my to draw list, which my patrons get to vote on every single month to see which monsters they would like to see in what order. So. If you'd like a little bit more control over the monsters that I draw and research, the videos that you see, the content that you get from me, then I'd urge you to head over to Patreon, because backers at every single level get the chance to vote on which monsters I do next. And your support, your tips, which can be as little as the price of a cup of coffee, really do help me to make these videos every single week for you. So if you choose to get involved with our little Patreon family and to help me make these videos, then thank you very much. But if you can't or you don't want to, then don't worry about it. I hope you enjoy the video anyway. And with that said, I think it's time to get started with today's video. The boule, spelt B-U-L-E-T-T-E, -E, but pronounced much more like ballet, is more commonly referred to, both in and outside of game, as the land shark, a phrase that will immensely influence how I draw this creature today. And it first appeared not in D&D, but in Gary Gygax's precursor game called Chainmail in the early 70s but was one of the first creatures to be written into the initial release of the game. These land sharks are named for their ability to swim through land, not unlike Chuck Norris. Monica bestowed upon them, not because of their physical might, of which there is no shortage at Strength 19, or their aerodynamic and durable armour plates, which grant them 17 AC, but instead due to a viscous mucus, or perhaps oil, that they produce all over their bodies, which liquefies the earth, and stone around them, according to an article called The Ecology of the Boule in 1983's issue 74 of Dragon Magazine. Thanks to the sheer length of time that Gary Gygax had been using these creatures in-game, and this fantastic article, written by Chris Elliott and Richard Edwards, we, as players, know an awful lot about this monstrous boule, but as it turns out, the inhabitants of your D&D world may not. Common hearsay and folklore attributes the origins of these creatures as either some ancient primordial monstrosities or the cursed meddling of wizards in the genetics of creatures native to your D&D world. And it's widely understood that these beasts were first formed by the fusion of a snapping turtle and an armadillo with a generous helping of demon ichor for good measure. But no one can be utterly sure Whoever knew the truth was likely devoured by the first one of these creatures and their insatiable, gigantic appetites. As for the real-world origins of the boule, at least in terms of D&D, I have to give credit to an interview with Tim Kask, one of the early editors and game testers of D&D during its creation on the Dorks of Yore YouTube channel. I'll leave a link to them down below. They're a lesser-known channel, but they're really good. And in this interview, Cast describes the development of this creature. He said that he, quote, went to Gary with a bag of monsters, referring the now legendary mixed bag of strange toys from Hong Kong that inspired many of D&D's most well-known and weird creatures, like the owlbear and the rust monster. Picking one toy that looked like a strange stag beetle with a scaly kind of bird beak on its face, they called it the bullet, because according to Task, again, quote, the only thing it had ever done is it had run down the corridor and knocked everyone off their feet a couple of times. Apparently, the move, referring to this creature as boule, as opposed to its original title of bullet, was because, in Cask's words, quote, there was a lot of anti-French sentiment pervading the United States at this point in time. He goes on to say, we like to mock everything French, so it became the boule. And later he goes on to mention that as a result of an article that Gary Gygax wrote, signifying that dwarven pack horses were very overpowered because they were stronger than those above land and didn't require light to see, it resulted that dwarven horses were all over the game, which Cask counters by, by turning the boule into a creature that tunnels through the earth, where dwarves tend to make their homes, 
and has a dietary preference for horses. Inspired also by the movie Jaws, which was incredibly popular at this time, the boule was finally refined into the beast that we all know and love. Now, on top of this, one of my patrons and most avid supporters, Bootsy, sent me a host of wonderful information related to the boule. Bootsy is from Germany and mentions there's this very, very popular dish known as Frikadella. He sent me a little video to help him pronounce these words, so I think we'll take it over to Bootsy so he can pronounce it for you. Hello, Josh. This is Bootsy with a little advice for the right pronunciation on those tricky German words. These meatballs, which are almost as popular in Germany as the Bratwurst, are widely known as Frikadelle. 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 Anyway, it's a ball of ground meat, onions, egg, breadcrumbs, and milk. But in Berlin, the people refer to it as the Bulette. Again, Bootsy, take it away. The Berlin version, which might have inspired Gary Gygax, is the Bulette. 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 He informed me that due to the Napoleonic occupation of Berlin in the early 1800s, the word la boule, meaning bowl or ball in French, was used to describe the little fricadella. He goes on to mention that the dish is so popular and so well known that it made no sense for the German translations of D&D to use this word to describe this terrifying land shark, because no one in Germany playing the game would be able to keep a straight face if they were being chased down and devoured by meatballs. And I'll be honest, we get the same reaction in the UK whenever the deadly blood sausage known as black pudding appears in our dungeons. Look out, the terrifying full English breakfast is coming to catch you. You'll have to deal with a potato scone, some slices of bacon, and a dreaded hot cup of tea. How will our adventurers survive? He said that instead they exclusively are printed as land sharks in the monster manual. But every German D&D player worth their salt knows the boulette or boule origins. The ridiculous name of meatball has been granted to one famous German creature, however, namely Bulette the hippo in the Berlin Zoo, who became a German celebrity after being born to the legendary Knautschka. Again, how are we pronouncing this one, Bootsy? The father of the hippo Bulette is called Knautschke. 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 Vielen Dank, Bootsy. Knautschka is the only hippo to survive the Second World War, and thus became a bit of a celebrity. But Buletta was famous in her own right, reaching 53 years old, made her the oldest mammal in any European zoo, before her unfortunate passing in 2005, a day engraved into the hearts and minds of the people of Berlin. But Meatball the Hippo sounds pretty damn adorable, I'll be honest with you so I can totally understand why she became a little overnight celebrity, regardless of her lineage. Unlike meatballs, however, the in-game boule is an elusive land-swimming predator who, as Tim Cask pointed out, are obsessed with eating horses, but it's also well known that they prefer halfling meat among the humanoid species of the world. And I couldn't find out why this would be. Maybe to combat the influx of players desperate to be halflings, who knows. Either way, it's well known that boulets also find the flesh of dwarves and elves pretty revolting, and only tend to kill them when they get in their way, which is pretty easy. Or if these creatures are particularly desperate. Their massive eight-foot armoured tanks were most famous for bursting from the ground with a powerful, deadly leap attack which takes their prey by surprise, not expecting this hulking juggernaut to be able to leap quite so far as it does. They have a 15-foot vertical leap, or can leap 30 feet forwards, and they land on their prospective meals with a flurry of slashes from their digging talons, combined with the weight of their massive armoured body for a potential 3d6 plus 4 bludgeoning damage, followed by 3d6 plus 4 slashing damage. And if you're unlucky enough, not dodge out of the way, becoming knocked down, or push back from the shockwave of mighty attacks. Now, this is a position that you definitely don't want to be in because, and because it gives the boule advantage on its other attack, a bite, which will surely spell doom for almost all adventurers facing a challenge rating five creature like the boule. The boule's bite deals 4d12 piercing damage 
is more than enough to snap the average horse in half. Despite their destructive nature, weirdly secretive as I've mentioned before, when they dwell underground. When they're not charging around on the surface at 40 feet per movement action, they also burrow at the same speed. They don't tend to have lairs of any particular kind or nests in particular. They don't choose a singular spot to call home, instead preferring to patrol a 30 mile territory, any food that can feel absent-mindedly walking above them with their tremor sense. Boulets come above ground for all sorts of things, however, not just to butcher unsuspecting dwarven convoys, but also to breathe. Although it's not mentioned in the Monster Manual, the Ecology of the Boulet article in Dragon Magazine mentions that they need to come up for air. So they have, obviously, a massive lung capacity. But they also come up to mate. We know that males of the species carve shallow pits above ground, which they line with the carcasses of deer and boars, and slowly grind their bones into a fine, misty powder over about a week by trampling and rolling all over this pit until the weight of their bodies crushes these carcasses. The combination of all the vibrations from this grinding process and the smell of decaying meat is more than enough to attract a female boulet, who, after only a day and a half, are able to lay roughly a dozen boulet eggs which are covered in defensive spines and spikes. Once hatched, the young, already exhibiting the appetite, which will define their species, attempt to attack and eat their mother, who likely controls the wild overpopulation of these beasts and their rapid growth and rapid birth rate by slaying a few of her young in self-defense. But it's pretty inevitable that she will become overwhelmed by her mass, her brood of young, killing her and making way for the next generation of boulets. So these creatures are absolutely great fun to play, and their physical design has changed a lot over the years. So it was quite a challenge trying to come up with what I thought these creatures might look like. I really love the Monster Manual version. They look nothing like any particular creature. They are their own beast, a very inventive way of making these creatures look. They look shark-like because they're gray sort of plates. They look very defendable. There's even a hint of demonicness in there. But as per usual, I wanted to play around with what we know about these creatures and see if it might influence how I like to draw them. So, obviously, the first thing that you'll notice is that sharks played a huge part in this. I really love the idea of a great white shark influencing the main body of this creature. So it has a very great white shark-like face. And sharks are famous for having these little tiny black eyes. And I thought that would be fantastic for these creatures as well. As they're going to be swimming through the land, there's going to be almost no visibility. Especially when they're attacking down beneath the earth in dwarven territory, they would need to be able to see quite well in the darkness. But one thing that sharks don't need that a land-dwelling animal probably would are eyelids, or at least very strong eyelids. So that's why it has a kind of more human-shaped eye there to protect its eye from dirt. Maybe like an amphibian, it has two sets of eyelids, one that slides sideways and are sort of translucent or transparent, and one sort of thick skin set. But either way, I thought it needed some eyelids. Also, I was really fascinated by early renditions of this creature, especially in that um, Dragon Magazine article. There's a wonderful drawing of a boulet that has these large plate-like sort of shards of armor on its back. And sharks actually have skin a bit like this, but on a very, very small level. If you ever look at shark skin under a microscope, you'll see that it's made out of lots of individual scales, we'll say, that are very smooth in one direction. But if you rub your hand the wrong way on a shark, well, let's say shark skin, don't go rubbing sharks. We don't need any casualties. You'll notice it's kind of sandpapery, not on like a cat's tongue or something like that. And I thought if we were to expand these scales into armadillo-like armor, then A, it would allow this creature to be very flexible, it would pay homage to sharks, and also would armor this creature sufficiently. And it's made mention that boulets are sort of potentially fusions of armadillos and snapping turtles, and there is something like an armadillo that looks a bit like this, the pangolin, who's covered in these sort of large diamond-like plates, and is also very flexible. So I took a lot of influence there, but also I looked at the pangolin lizard, which has a lot of these kind of bone-like spikes and scales. Most notably, I kind of almost entirely copied a pangolin lizard's tail, which has these kind of reticulated, strange-shaped uh, plates on its tail, which I thought suited the boulet very, very well. Further to this, um, one of the things mentioned in the Dragon Magazine article is that 
the boule produces this kind of slime, ooze, oil, whatever you want to call it, all over its body that liquefies soil so that it can swim through it effortlessly. Also, one of the things that doesn't appear in the 5th edition Monster Manual, but does appear in other ones, is a vulnerability, a weak spot on these creatures. It's said that they raise a kind of fin-like dorsal plate when they swim through the land. You get this image of a shark literally swimming through the land. And if you were to jump on the back of one of these creatures, there would be this exposed area of soft, weak flesh behind this raised plate. So I thought perhaps this is maybe where this oil comes from. Maybe it only raises this plate when it's underground and sort of swimming through the land, producing this oil or slime. And it's a weak spot. Maybe people have advantage to attack it there. Or maybe attacks do more damage at that point if you manage to strike it there. But otherwise, usually it would protect itself and lower this when it was above ground. The Dragon Magazine article also mentions that villagers harvest this oil wherever they can and coat their plows with it so that their farming tools can easily glide through the earth, something that your players might want to harvest from these creatures as well if you have an unfortunate encounter with one. As for the pose, I was very interested at looking at creatures that were naturally armoured in the real world but were also quite large, and I thought of the Ankylosaur, a dinosaur famous for being a tank, which had this huge cobbled tail that it used like a giant mallet. It would raise its hindquarters and kind of almost like a scorpion sting would coil its tail behind it to smack people out of the way if they got too close and threatened it. So I imagine it would have to have very, very strong legs to lift such a heavy body. So this is why the back legs, the jumping legs of this creature look very Ankylosaur-like. The front legs, I thought if this is a creature that's digging through the earth, we need to have some mole or some mole rat kind of features to this, which is why A, the teeth rather than being shark teeth are more kind of vermin-like. And also, they have sort of mole's feet, apparently called polydactyl forepaws. Apparently moles have an extra thumb called a prepolex, which only has one joint, but it makes them very, very good at digging forwards through the soil. And I felt that it was very appropriate for something that deals so much slashing damage and does so much burrowing to have some influence from moles. And that's how I ended up with my boule appearance. And I'm really pleased with it. Seems that I accidentally arrived at a similar illustration to this kind of early illustration of the boule, and it makes enough sense to me, so this is how I like to depict them. But obviously, the 5th edition version is also really, really cool. What do boules look like in your games? Make sure to let me know if they're some other variant or something in between all these options. I'd really love to know. But anyway, I think that's where we'll leave the video for today. I just wanted to say another huge thank you to Bootsy provided such wonderful information, completely out of the blue. Didn't ask him for anything, he just sent me a few messages and a video of himself describing these things, me plenty of information to talk to you guys about that I would never normally have come across. So if you know I'm making a video like this and you have some information to offer, it probably won't be on the internet anywhere. Or if you just need to talk, feel free to shoot me a message and I'll reply to you if I can. Otherwise, I'm almost always in the YouTube comments whenever I get a spare moment replying to you guys. So. If you have something that you want to say down in the YouTube comments, please make sure to do so. Especially if it's a suggestion for a monster that I can add to my to draw list, which my patrons can then vote on. Which reminds me, if you want to support me in a very personal way, you want to get a chance to vote on all the monsters that I draw each month, and you want exclusive rewards like prints of all my Monster Mondays, one-on-one -on -one video chats, or exclusive live stream, and you really want to help this channel to grow and help me to make these videos, then I'd urge you to head over to my Patreon page backers get all sorts of rewards like that. And if you want to support the channel, you don't want to do it financially. That's totally fine. I'd ask you to leave a little like if you enjoyed this video, perhaps favorite it, and share it with any communities that you're a part of, maybe the rest of your D&D party. And hey, subscribe because I make videos every single week, every single Monday, and I'd hate for you to miss a monster that you're going to find really useful. Anyway, if you hear the ground rumbling underneath you, make sure you're not riding the dwarven horse, or else you might find yourself accidentally part of a boule's meal. And until next time, happy monster hunting.